We have a tradition around here, and when we say he is risen, you say he is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen indeed. It is Easter Sunday morning. My name is Crystal Culp. I'm the pastor of adult discipleship here at First Church. And we're so glad, whether you're here in the room, or you're online or on the radio, that you have chosen to spend your Easter Sunday with us. If you're new here or maybe you've been here for a few weeks and you haven't connected yet, when you're ready, we would love to connect with you. And you can do that if you're here in the room at the Info Hub, or if you're online, you can scan this QR code, or also, if you're here in the room, and if you would like to, you can scan the QR code that's on the back of your seats. That just takes you to a place that helps us connect with you, and you connect with us so that we can help you get more acquainted and more connected around here at First Church. Again, we're so thankful that you're here. We're so thankful that you are spending your Easter Sunday with us. You know, today we celebrate the victory that was won on the cross. And as believers, we are Easter people. We no longer have to abandon ourselves to despair because when Jesus rose from the dead, so did we. You know, Jesus didn't just cheat death. He beat it fair and square. The enemy was crushed. He was ground into the dirt as Jesus burst forth from the grave. He brought beauty from ashes. On Easter morning, when the sun rose, all of heaven stood to their feet as the King of kings and Lord of lords laid aside his grave clothes and wrapped us, wrapped us in life everlasting. He made a way for you and I to know what it is to be completely utterly, wholly forgiven once and for all. He bought our freedom. He paid our debt in full. My grandfather, John C. Glover, affectionately known as Pappy, passed away before I was born. And although I didn't have the privilege of knowing him, I became acquainted with him through the eyes of my father and the stories that he shared with me over the years. One such story that really took root in my heart was born out of the years of the Great Depression. My grandfather was a successful businessman. Some would have said that he was a wealthy man in his day. He owned the local grocery store in the town of Hickman, Kentucky. When the Great Depression hit, my grandfather was able to keep the shelves stocked with the much needed groceries. He would allow those who could not afford to pay for their groceries to sign an invoice with a promise to pay. As the days went by and the Depression ended, there were some who came back to pay, but then there were many more who never came back to pay. My dad witnessed many days of my grandfather pulling out those invoices, flipping through them, and then they would go back under the counter. As my father shared this story, I began to realize and cherish to this day what a wonderful man my grandfather was, a man of character, integrity, and a love for others. He could have lived in bitterness and in anger and regret, but instead, one day, he pulled those invoices out for the last time. He gathered them up along with a box of matches, went out the back of the store, struck a match. They went up in flames, and as they did, my grandfather raised both hands and said, I am free. Well, if you can't tell by the hair and the accent, that's my mom. And that was my great-grandfather. I'll never forget the first time my mom told us that story. I found myself really getting emotional like I am today. But it reminded me that, guys, our freedom wasn't free. It wasn't free. Our debt was paid. It was paid on the cross by our Savior. And we celebrate that in Jesus. We celebrate that we're free. 
that Christ arose. He rose in victory and he lives forever. And now, because of Easter, we can too. He is risen. Would you stand and continue to celebrate with us in worship as we sing praises to our risen Savior, Christ arose. Let's sing this out.
sin was heavy, the chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter, I was a Father God, we come to you today celebrating that God, because of you, that we can leave darkness behind, that there is hope beyond the grave, that Father God, in this glorious day today, that we can celebrate, and God, we can recognize that we are Easter people, that we believe, God, that you sent your son to die on a cross, and we know that this is the truth, God, that Jesus is alive. And because he is alive, God, we now can live in eternity with you. God, thank you for that gift. Father, I pray today would not go by that we would not celebrate and find joy in the resurrection of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Father God, we worship you. We give you all of the honor and all of the praise because of the gift that you gave us in your Son, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father, for paying our debt in full. God, thank you for the freedom that we now have in you. We love you. We need you. We know that you have called us from the pit, God, to live in wholeness, fully alive, fully forgiven, fully free of the weight of sin and death. And God, today we say thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for Easter Sunday and what it represents to all of us who call you our Lord and Savior. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. You can be seated. Well, as you're being uh, seated, I just want to, again, echo again, welcome you to Easter Resurrection Sunday. And so Crystal doesn't have all the fun. He is risen. He is risen. He is risen. He is risen. Amen. Take your Bible, if you would, and turn with me as we explore this wonderful story, this resurrection story. We're going to look at uh, the Apostle John's record of the resurrection we find in John chapter 20. Uh, As you're turning there, let me just give you a little preview. Uh, Next weekend, we start a new series where we're going to talk about uh, family and parenting and relationships and, and what it looks like for us to be a church family and how we interact and love one another together. And so, uh, as always, we'll try to be very practical, some things that will be super helpful to you in real life that you can apply in uh, real life. Uh, but, of course, always from God's Word and the truth that we find in it, and that is always, as we look at it, always, always, always so practical. Uh, as you're uh, turning to uh, John chapter uh, 20, uh, have you ever had one of those occasions where you discovered something for the first time, and then after you discovered it for the first time, you thought, you know what, it just seems like I should have realized that. I should have known that. I should have kind of caught that. I should have got that memo a little earlier. Uh, I want to share with you some things that, and I know that uh, you're probably way ahead of me. These are probably things you all know already, but I just wanted to share some, some things that uh, it just took me a while to get the memo on. The first one, the first example is this. Uh, I don't know how many of you uh, know, uh, and I didn't understand this for a long time, but in your car, as you're sitting in your car and you look at your gas gauge, there's a little arrow. And the direction that arrow, whatever side that arrow's on, is the side that your gas, the, the, uh, the gas tank on your car is on. 
mind blown. I, I, I re- literally just a few years ago, will anybody just admit that today for the first time you're realizing that, I mean, some, this is truth that you did not realize till today. Okay. All right. Okay. You are welcome. <laughs> Aren't you glad you came to church? You learned a little something. Hopefully you'll get a little bit more out of, out of today. Another thing that I didn't realize till this weekend, because I was kind of looking at some, for some examples, um, Chinese, the Chinese takeout, the Chinese food takeout um, little box thing, if you remove the metal thing, the handle, you move the little metal handle, you open it up, it's a plate. Wow. Who would have thought? Didn't get the memo on that. Okay, uh, another one is the... The, the, the spaghetti ladle thing that you get the spaghetti out of the water when you're cooking spaghetti, and there's the hole in the bottom of it that it's not just to drain water out of. That hole is a perfect one serving size. Did not realize that. And the final one, some of you are like, oh yeah, whatever, I already knew that. Some of you are taking notes. Oh, I see you taking notes. That's good. Um, <laughs> The last one that I thought was really cool, I did not realize this, just discovered this yesterday. As they say, um, I was yesterday years old when I, when I realized this. Um, so yesterday years old, I did not realize that a tic-tac container, how many times have you stood there trying to get a single tic-tac out of the tic-tac container and like two, three, four, twelve comes out all at the same time? Did you know that the tic-tac container is made so that if you open it, a single tic-tac, the container is made for this. Now, I was in the first service, and I did it, and like 12 came out. <laughs> so I so just want to confess that. But yes, it's made to distribute one tic-tac at a time. You're welcome. Mind blown. I, mine was as well. Some things that we understand, finally, we, get, we, we think about them, we think, you know what, I, I don't know why I didn't understand that, I don't know why I didn't see that earlier. This story, the story of the resurrection, is a story that a lot of people in the story did not understand till later what was going on. Father, I pray as we open up your word, I pray that today would be one of those days of discovery, that you would teach us some things that, that maybe we didn't realize, that you would remind us of some things that maybe we'd forgotten, and maybe somebody even here is here today, and they've come and they've, they've, they've considered the story, but they've never embraced it as, as something that is life-changing, true to them. And God, today, I pray that you would help us as we look at this story in a fresh way. You will help us to name your son confess him, name him as Lord and Savior, to believe that Jesus Christ did indeed raise from the dead. I pray that you would help us. Speak to us now in the next few moments as we look into your word. We pray in Jesus' name. So it was Friday. It was Friday and Jesus is crucified. His body is taken from the cross. It's laid in a tomb. His disciples, his followers, everyone thought that the dream that they had had, had believed about him was over. The, the dream of him being a deliverer, a Messiah, the Christ, a Savior, all of that had died with him on the cross. As a result of that, his followers, his disciples are scattered. They're wondering, they're fearful. Will we be next? Will we be the next ones that they take? Will we be the next ones crucified with him as his followers? Mixed with that wondering, that fearful uh, foreboding that they were experiencing, they were also brokenhearted. Brokenhearted, again, that their hopes of Jesus being the Messiah died with him on a cross. None of them understood God's plan. None of them understood what was going to happen on that Sunday, on the day that we now gather and we call, we've named Easter, but they soon would. Let's look at this. First, Resurrection Sunday and see what they experience and what they finally, the aha moment they had, and hopefully we'll have a similar aha moment ourselves. John chapter 20, verse 1. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Now the first day of the week in their calendar would have been Sunday. 
Their day of worship is, was Saturday, but, but, uh, but this is Sunday. Uh, their Sabbath was Saturday, but here they are on Sunday. So the resurrection of Jesus Christ, just get this, the resurrection was so radical, so monumental, so cataclysmic that the church, we see it in the book of Acts, that it says that the church began to worship on that first day of the week. The church began to worship not on, not on Saturday, but, but changed to Sunday. And it's why to this day we continue to worship on Sunday because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now Mary, who it says goes to the tomb. Many scholars, church tradition tells us that she is the one that Jesus had delivered from bondage to Satan, a woman of ill repute, as they say. And she, along with some others, although uh, John just, just records her, but there are others with her, arrives at the tomb first. And she comes with, with these burial spices. She's going to adorn the, the body of Jesus further. He was hastily prepared for burial, and so she's going to make sure that it was done right. It's a final act of her love uh, for him. It shows how much she cares for him. And so she comes to the tomb early to do that. And imagine the shock as she comes. And again, she's already brokenhearted. And then as she comes, the, the stone is gone. The tomb is empty. And she's shocked. What has happened? Her mind is just racing. What's happened to my Savior? Thieves, grave robbers, and it was a thing back then. Uh, if you look in uh, history, uh, as Claudius, one of the Roman emperors, it was such a problem that he declared it uh, as a capital crime to uh, uh, grave robbing, and so it was a thing. And so, is that what happened? Did they take his body? Who who would have done such a thing? And so she, again, as all these emotions swirling, she runs back to Peter, verse two, and so she ran back and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them. They've taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we, notice we, so she's talking about us, and we do not know where they've laid him. Now we see here, and we see it throughout the story, that no one was expecting Jesus to be resurrected. No one. Their experience is similar to our experience, that typically when people are dead, they stay dead. Has that been your experience? It's been my experience, and it was their experience. And so no one was expecting for Jesus to rise again. Uh, but she goes back and she reports that they took him. I don't know where they took his body. So it's not just someone took his body, but someone's took his body is the implication. And we don't know where they laid him. And again, she's not anticipating he's, been, he's risen from the dead. She's, she thinks that there's a body, the body of Jesus is somewhere, it's just not in that tomb. And I don't know where they took his body. And that's what she's talking about. The implication, again, is that he's still dead. She still doesn't get it. Her heart's in the right place. She loves Jesus. She's going to do uh, in a final act what she can to honor him, to honor his life and what what he's meant to her and and, and the interactions that they've had and just to, to honor that and to make sure that he's properly cared for in death. And that's what she's trying to do at the tomb. Again, she really doesn't understand what's going on. She doesn't understand what Jesus came to do. She doesn't understand that Jesus has risen from the dead. She doesn't understand. But when she does understand, it's something that will radically change her life and her eternity. Verse 3. And Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. Now, just so you know, the other disciple that is being referred to here, that's John. Okay, John is the guy, he's the author. And just, it's just kind of funny to me, and we've said this in previous years, but it's just kind of funny, I just want to point out to you that, that John, the author, it, it's just it's cool how he, he kind of describes himself. So he describes himself, the one that Jesus loved. He, and there's a couple of verses before. So it's just like he's, he's talking, he's kind of, you know, he's just kind of bragging, uh, but not bragging in, in, the, in the text. And notice it says, and the other disciple outran Peter. Just wanted for all time to know I'm faster than Peter. In case you're wondering, I'm faster than Peter. Uh, it just, it's just kind of funny that he includes that. And so they end up at the tomb, and the tomb is empty. No one, again, up to this point, thinks anything except that someone or someones have stolen the body. There's something uh, that Jesus, not that Jesus is risen from the dead. That's not even crossing anyone's mind. They don't understand. 
Mary and the other women didn't understand. Peter and John, arguably, they were the inner circle of Jesus. So if anybody would have, would have known, would have understood what was going on, they would have. But even they don't understand. None of the disciples understand. Verse 5. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him, and he went into the tomb. And he saw the linen cloths lying there in the face cloth which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but, but folded up in a place by itself. So John gets there, gets there first. I'm faster than Peter. Gets there first. The tomb notices that the tomb is open, looks inside, doesn't go inside, but looks inside, and notices that the grave clothes are, are still there. And he hesitates. Now, that wasn't such an odd thing not to go into the tomb the way they were raised, they, they were very conscious of doing things that would make them unclean. And so even being in a cemetery uh, was a big deal. And to go in a tomb was even a bigger deal that would make you unceremonial, unclean. Uh, and so he stands, stands there outside the tomb. But then Peter shows up. Peter, impetuous Peter, act first, think later, Peter. And Peter runs up and he dips right into the tomb. And he sees the grave clothes. It's almost like the... It kind of the way it's described here in the original language. It's almost like the body has just kind of, kind of just been lifted up, leaving the grave clothes there, just lying there, just like they were, just like they had been on the body, but now the body is, is not there. And so that's the, the implication of that. And what does it say also? It says that, that the face cloth had been, that would have been separate from the, what was, uh, uh, around the body, the face cloth, its head was wrapped in something separate, and it says that 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 separate cloth is folded up and lying separately from the rest of the clothes. Now, I have really no idea of why God put that in there except to just give proof for all time that men can actually fold clothes. So, if you, men, if you want to be more more like Jesus, then you should fold clothes. That Jesus fold, fold, fold clothes, you can do it if you want to be like Jesus, any, any, any spouses want to just give a little amen to that? You can do it. Oh, it was really cool. After the first service, somebody's come up to me and said, you know what, I always heard that when, you, when you're eating a meal, the tradition is if you're done with your meal and you're, you're finished, that you just crumple up the napkin and you, and, and you put it on your place in front of you. But if you're coming back, you fold it up and you lay it there. Jesus is coming back. Now, I don't know if that's why, but that's a really cool idea. Jesus Christ is coming back. Notice what it says next, and this is really important. Verse 8, and the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. John joins, Jesus, or joins Peter in the tomb. And finally, as they're in the tomb together, and they're looking around, and the grave clothes are there, and the, and the, the thing that was around his head is lying separately than, than the others. The stone's been rolled away, and they're looking around, and, and this is not at all the scene. If this was grave robbers had done this, this is not at all the way that they, they would have left the tomb. And so that can't be it. And so as they check, it can't be this, and it can't be that. And then they, you know, I don't know what was going on, but maybe imagine them thinking back on what Jesus said, that this is exactly what was going to happen. And it finally all of it clicks and it says and they believed they finally realized you're here today and you've heard a lot of stories you've heard this story a lot and I think there's probably someone here today that as God is speaking to you that you're going to get it for the first time you're going to connect the dots of how much God loves you that he sent his son to die that you could have life And that son has risen from the dead. An exclamation point from God the Father. Today is the day, like Peter and John, do you finally get it. It says in that next verse, and as yet they did not understand the Scripture. For as of yet they did not understand the Scripture. So it says, you know, before they got there, they didn't understand. But then after they got there and after they saw it, then they understood. They understood that he must rise from the dead. And then the disciples went back to their homes. 
So again, up to this point, uh, the betrayal, the trial, the physical torture, the crucifixion, them taking him down off the cross, them laying in a tomb, all of it, they didn't connect the dots, all of it they didn't understand. They come to the tomb, they're on their way, they still don't get it, the stone is rolled away, they still don't get it, and then they finally, finally, finally go inside and realize that what Scripture says about the resurrection, that he must rise from the dead, is true. And it reminds us how critical the resurrection is. How absolutely critical to our salvation the resurrection is. How absolutely critical to our eternal life the resurrection is that Jesus must, the scripture says, Jesus must rise from the dead. And so they finally get it and they finally believe. And when they do that, everything changes. It reminds you of how mission critical the resurrection of Jesus is. Paul the apostle writing the church at Corinth says it this way in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 16. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Now I want you to go back, and I want you to, let's understand together what we, what, what is it that, that, is, that is critical? What is, what's that mission critical stuff that we need to understand? Look at, go back in verse, to verse 8 and 9. And the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Verse 9 there tells us that even though these guys had, they were, they were Jewish, they, that's their roots, they'd gr- g- grown up in Judaism, they'd grown up uh, memorizing Scripture, knowing Scripture, studying Scripture, it was hardcore, in-depth study of Scripture that they would have gone through as children, and then they, they, uh, they make the cut, they're part of Jesus' disciples, they follow him around for three and a half years, and he's teaching, and he's, he's sharing all kinds of things, all manner of stuff, and even though they've gone through all of that, and know all, they should know all of those things, but the text tells us that they still don't understand. They still don't understand, as verse 9 says, that he must rise from the dead. They need to understand it. And so what do we need to understand? We need to understand what they didn't get at first. Think back again to 1 Corinthians 15. And 1 Corinthians 15 says that, it, that he must rise from the dead, that he that it's vital to our faith, our faith is futile without it, that we're still in, in our sins if, if he didn't rise from the dead. So again, we go back to the resurrection story, and on that Easter, they finally get it, they finally understand, we need to understand. We need to understand what the scriptures say. And prophetically, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years before this event, it's recorded in scripture that it's going to happen. And the psalmist writes in Psalm 16, verse 10, For you will not leave my soul among the dead, or allow your Holy One to rot in the grave. The psalmist, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, records here in the Psalms what's going to take place in the resurrection of Jesus. My Holy One will not rot in the grave. Uh, Both Peter and Paul, you can see it in the book of Acts that, uh, you know, happens after all of this. After the resurrection, after Christ goes back and the church is birthed, in the book of Acts, in Acts 2 and Acts 13, both Peter and Paul use that text from the Old Testament text, Psalm 16, 10, and they quote it as they're talking about the resurrection of Jesus. Like, just like it said way back then, here we see Jesus did indeed rise from the dead. We have the prophet Isaiah. And we don't have time to look at a bunch of examples, but I just want to, just another one, an example that The book of Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, reminds us of how critical it is that Jesus would give his life, that that he would give his life on a cross, and it describes what would happen that would ultimately lead, because he dies on the cross, and then he's buried, and then he is risen, so it's a a key piece to have a resurrection, you've got to have a death, and this passage describes that death in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 3, again written hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years before, he was despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their face, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that, was, that brought, bought, brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. 
we have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. So we have there that graphic description of what would happen to Jesus on the cross, again, hundreds of years before the event. And so they didn't, when it says that they didn't understand what the Scriptures had said, the Scriptures had, had outlined what was going to happen. They just didn't get it. They didn't connect all the dots. What r- really baffles me is not only that they didn't connect those dots, and that was a little, you know, it's a little subtle, so we'll give them a pass, but Jesus literally told them what was going to happen. And he didn't, he didn't beat around the bush. He said, I'm going to be, I'm gonna be uh, you know, afflicted. I'm going to suffer. They're going to crucify me. And then I'm going to rise from the dead. He, di- he wasn't real subtle with what he said. He said exactly what was going to, ha- going to happen. And the synop- synoptic gospels are Matthew, Mark, and Luke. That's what they call the first three gospels. Each of the first three gospels tell that story three times. So that's nine times recorded what Jesus said to his disciples that he would, be, he would suffer, he would be crucified, and he would rise again. John, uh, in his gospel, and we're in the gospel of John, John's a little more subtle uh, with what he says about uh, Jesus and his suffering and that he would die and all that. Uh, when, I was a, when I was a kid, a little kid, uh, I loved to make people laugh, and when I was a little kid, I thought one day I wanted to be a comedian. Now, I know you're thinking, wow, that's a, your life is a big divergent from that because you're not funny at all. <laughs> um, Crystal agrees with you. Um, but, I, you know, I, I sometimes, and I'm probably the only guy that does this, but sometimes I will try to be funny and I'll say something and at Crystal's kind of expense a little bit. I don't know if you guys, other guys, you're smarter than this, but, but, but I do that and I don't get the subtle hint that I need to be quiet because she's not laughing. You know what I mean? Okay, it's kind of subtle. Uh, John's a little subtle of what he's saying, but they should have been able to pick up on what uh, we see in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John recorded where Jesus talks about what's going to happen. Let me give you one example. We see it in Luke chapter 24, the second part of verse 6, where they're looking back. They're talking about what Jesus said to them previously about his resurrection. Remember how he told you. While he was still in Galilee. And listen to what Jesus said to them. He told, remember what he told you? That the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. He told you exactly what was going to happen. And you witnessed, you saw him suffer. You saw him being scourged. You saw them put him on a cross. You saw him die by crucifixion. You saw them put him in a tomb, and you show up at the tomb. The stone has been rolled away, and you still don't connect the dots. And we think, these guys are dense. But friends, how many ways has God tried to get your attention? How many times has God tried to show you how much he loves you? How many times? How many times? How many times? Before we cast too much shade on these guys. We have to recognize we have all done similar things. So what do we need to understand? They didn't get the memo. What do we need to understand? First, what do we need to understand about his death? Now, we went over this. Uh, if you were here for a Good Friday service, if you, if you were not here, I'm sorry. And I, I, I hate to say this, but you missed it. It was awesome. Uh, and it was an awesome experience. And you can go back, you can go to our YouTube channel, and you can check it out. You can go to myfirstchurch.com, you can check it out. I would encourage you to do that. But we talked a lot, so I'm not going to relitigate it, but, but we talked a lot about what Christ did for us on the cross. So just real briefly, I just want to remind us of what he did for us when he died for us. And when he died on the cross for us, he was paying our debt, the debt that we had incurred because of our sin. As a result of that sin, And we see, as we look around our world, and we look at our lives, we see the way that sin mars our lives. We see the way it mars and destroys our world. We see the the way when we heap our sins together, how together we are so destructive as 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 a people together. We see how our sin breaks our relationship with God, and we've all experienced that. If we just will be, pay attention and look around, it's without question, we see it in our world. And God sent his son to correct our human condition through what Jesus did on the cross. 
And it's a word that we don't use a whole lot in our vocabulary, but it's a word called, it's a word atonement. What Jesus Christ did on the cross, he atoned for us. And that's a, if you just explode that word into, the, in, into its parts, at one meant. And that's an easy way to remember what it's talking about. This, what Christ did for us on the cross, makes us at one with God. Reconciles us. What Jesus did for us makes us one. At one meant, just means when you, the suffix meant, is it's just the act of doing something, the result of that action. So as a result of what Christ did on the cross, the result of that is making us at one with God. That's what Christ did. The atonement settles the debt that our sin created and reconciles us back into relationship with God. We owed a debt that we couldn't pay, and Jesus paid for it uh, on our own. If we're, you know, just, if we can't work, can't be good enough, can't go to church enough, all those things, we can't pay it off on our own, and it makes us, what Jesus did for us, his atonement makes us one with God. The Hebrew word that's translated atone, atonement, is the word kafar, and it literally means to cover, to make reconciliation. It, it conveys this idea of a covering for sin, and in the Old Testament, we see uh, it, you know, it's not covering like hiding it, it's dealing with it. And so in the Old Testament, when animals were sacrificed, they were a covering for the sins of the people. A life for a life. It, it reminds us, the sacrificial system, how uh, the, the, the nature of sin and, and, and how, how, how egregious sin is. And this covering, what the sacrifice, the, when the blood is, is paid, just reminds us of the serious nature of sin that's covered with that cost that's paid. And what Jesus did for us on the cross was a once and for all time sacrifice to cover, to satisfy, to cover our sins. Uh, when I was a youth pastor back in Illinois, I first came out of college, um, uh, there was this guy in the church, he's, he was a you know, leader kind of personality, and he comes to me and says, hey David, uh, I'd like to take you out to lunch. You're going to go to lunch? And I was like, oh sure. And he said, well you need to probably block off the afternoon for lunch. I'm like, oh okay, it's a long lunch, but all right. And so he shows up at the house. He says, I'll pick you up, tells me the time. He shows up at my house on a motorcycle. Uh, this big old, and he was a big old boy. He's one of those, he'd go bear hunting with a loose leaf notebook. He's a big old boy. So uh, I get on the back of the, of the it, we're, we're getting ready to, for me to get on the back of the motorcycle. And he says, have you ever eaten at Lambert's? Has anybody ever eaten at Lambert's? Lambert's is the home of the throwed rolls. Yes, if you've never been there, you have no idea what we're talking about. Uh, you're missing it. Uh, does anybody know where Lambert's is? Sykeston, Missouri. Sykeston. I'm, in, I'm living in Effingham, Illinois. Now, for those of you who are not up on your Midwest geography, that is a one-way, almost three-hour drive on the back of a motorcycle for lunch. We are on our, I'm going to write a book one day to Helen back, and that's going to be the title of this, this story. So we go on our way there. I realize you got a lot of time to think when you're on the back of a motorcycle for three hours. And so I'm thinking, I realize I forgot my wallet. We're eating lunch at Lambert's, the home of the throat rolls, and we're eating lunch, and I cannot enjoy my lunch because I'm thinking, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? Oh, I'm so embarrassed. I, you know, I should have said something a long time ago, and now I've eaten. And, and just this whole thing, and just my, you know, the whole meal was ruined. The check comes, and he says, hey, let me cover this. I had a debt I could not pay. I had no ability to pay the debt. That I was going to have to go in the back and wash dishes or something. I had no ability to pay the debt. He covered my debt. That's what Jesus did for us. There was a cost that he paid for me. There's a cost that Jesus paid for us. It is the atonement. That's the idea. Jesus' work on the cross to satisfy our debt. Now, when we think about the work of the cross, this is Resurrection Sunday, so we want to focus on the, on the resurrection. So just real quick, let me remind you of what Paul says in that letter again. If Christ has not been raised, then our faith is futile. Our faith is in vain, that we are still in our sin. So what do we need to understand about the resurrection then? 
And what we need to understand about the resurrection is the resurrection is critical for our forgiveness. The resurrection is the definitive proof that Jesus is the Son of God. The resurrection validates and confirms that Jesus is everything he claimed to be. The resurrection, without it, would, it would be the end of the story of Jesus' life, dead in a tomb somewhere. The resurrection is proof that the story is not over. The resurrection is proof that Jesus, when he said, I'm coming back to take you to be with me, that he's going to make good on his word, that he is coming again. The resurrection is proof in the decisive victory that Jesus Christ won for us over sin and death. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 55. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of sin, death is sin. The power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. The resurrection. Great time for an amen right there. Resurrection makes all the difference. And pa- Paul reminds us there. All will be made alive. The resurrection, we will be resurrected, in other words, as we put our faith, we put our trust in Christ. And finally, we need to understand, because of the resurrection, when we put our faith in Christ, when we confess Christ as Lord, when we believe that, that He's been risen from the dead, that we are raised with Him to new life in Christ, in this life, now. We have victory in this life now, a life characterized by Christ-likeness and holiness and the power of the Holy Spirit alive in us now with victory over sin made possible now as Romans eight eleven reminds us, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Friends, the resurrection of Jesus Christ is not merely a miraculous event. But it is the pivotal moment of human history that alters the spiritual, moral, and eternal destiny of everyone who believes. It validates the truth of Christianity. It secures our victory over sin and death. It empowers us to live a transformed life in the present. Is anybody else getting excited that Jesus Christ not only did all that, but he is coming again? The resurrection makes all of that possible. And so let's end with a so what moment. So what? Verse 10. And then the disciples went back to their homes. They went home different than how they came to the tomb. They went home believing. They went home understanding. They went home embracing Jesus Christ as, as, as the one who rose from the dead. And they might not have totally understood everything because there is more to be revealed. But they, they went home changed. And so just my question as we conclude today, how are, you going to get, how are you going to go home? What do we need to understand as we go home? We need to understand that yes, Jesus died, but yes, Jesus rose again. And he rose again in fulfillment of Scripture that had been written Ages ago, it started in the garden with Adam and Eve when, when, when they sinned and they, that debt began, the toll began and we've contributed all to that sin debt. And Jesus Christ on the cross paid that sin debt for us. It reminds us of what he paid. The resurrection is the confirmation that our debt has been paid in full. And so again, my question for us on this resurrection Sunday, how will you go home? How will you go home? Will you understand what Christ did for you? Will you understand how what he did for you changes everything? Will you go home celebrating what he did and and how it makes a difference now and how it will make a difference for you in the future, that the death has been swallowed up, the death has no longer any victory over us? Will you commit to give your life back? Go home committing to give your life back in the service of the one who sent his son to die and to be raised from the dead so that we could be raised to new life, to give your life back, to make your life through through you, we could make much of Jesus together. Or will you go home the same? Will you go home even though we've tried to connect the dots, you'll go home the same. And you're not yet ready to make that step of faith. And I just wanna encourage you not to give up, to continue to pursue and continue to ask questions and continue to, to, to delve in to what Scripture teaches and the truth of the gospel. And ask God to reveal himself to you so that one day you will connect those dots. 
and you will embrace Christ as Savior. Now, if you're ready to do that, I'm going to pray in just a moment, and I want to encourage you today to go home, not the same, but different. Go home as a follower of Christ. Go home as one who has confessed and believes that Jesus Christ rose from the dead and the implications that that makes now and for your eternity. So as I pray in just a moment, I want to encourage you to pray with me and make that decision. On the back of your chairs, there's a QR code. It's a little hard to see, but if you look, every other chair or so has, has one. And you can scan that QR code. We would love to help you on that journey of what it looks like to follow Christ. And that will take you to a page, and then you can let us know about yourself, and we will be in contact with you. We'd love to help you on that journey. Uh, these altars are going to be open as we sing. In just a few moments, there's people that would love to pray with you if you've got a need that's unrelated to salvation. If you've got something going on, we'd love to pray with you. But whatever's going on, uh, these altars will be open. Just know that, you, that we'd love to pray with you about whatever. One of the best prayers we'd love to pray with you is if you'd like to invite Christ to be your Savior, we'd love to pray with you. Let's stand this morning. Heavenly Father, as we stand, God, we thank you for what we've learned today, what we've been reminded of today, this, this great resurrection story. And Father, I pray as we come to the tomb, just like Peter and John came to the tomb, as we dip together into the tomb, as we looked at the story, we've looked at your word, God, I pray you'd help us not to go home the same. I pray, Father, for that person that for the first time that, that you've connected the dots for them and your spirit has been moving them, they recognize just the need, they just want to embrace your son as Savior, believing that Christ rose from the dead. And I thank you, God, that you're forgiving them, that you're setting them free, God, that, that you've got an attorney in store for them. And <clears throat> I pray that you would help us help them to now grow in their new life in Christ. Thank you, Father, for what you're doing in lives and hearts. And God, as we sing this final song, I pray, Father, you'd help us to celebrate the victory that your son has, 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 has made it made possible for all of us. Help us to celebrate the resurrected Lord that's resurrecting us. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Again, these altars are open if you'd like to come as we worship and celebrate.
He's alive. I don't know if you heard me. He's alive. <laughs> and that makes a difference in our lives now and for. It's pretty cool that there's a little thing on a Tic Tac dispenser. And it's pretty cool that you can open up your Chinese thing. And it's a plate. And it's pretty cool. You can understand what side of the ga- your car the gas gauge is on. But did you hear the story that Jesus Christ is alive? And that makes everything different. Father, as we leave this place, I pray, Father, you help us to go changed. Help us to go recognizing the absolutely monumental cataclysmic difference it makes to know that our Savior is not in a tomb somewhere, but he is risen from the dead. And so as a result, oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And everyone said, amen. God bless you as you leave in the power of the resurrection.